Thank you, Mr. Kocher. Uh, the hearing before the panel uh, this evening is an appeal uh, by the licensee of the Chief License Inspector's decision to suspend the business license issued to her on February 8th, 2022 uh, for the provision of short-term rental accommodation uh, at Unit 802183 Kiefer Street in the City of Vancouver. Uh, a copy uh, of that license uh, is contained under the materials uh, at tab 4, uh, paginated at uh, page 18 in the top uh, right-hand corner. Uh, the suspension by the Chief License Inspector and the basis, therefore, uh, is set out in the letter of August 31st, uh, 2022, uh, to the licensee, uh, which is included in the materials at tab 14. Uh, and I'm just going to read uh, a portion of that uh, letter uh, for you. Uh, the page number in the upper right-hand side is uh, page 192. Uh, this is the suspension letter from the Chief License Inspector, and you'll see uh, from the second uh, paragraph in the letter the basis for the decision. I'll just read that for the panel. Uh, the city has determined that in consideration of the totality of information, including documentation provided during your audit, information received from the community, the compliance inspection, and information from the meeting, the information does not support that Unit 802183 Kiefer Place is your principal residence. As per License Bylaw 4450, Section 25.1 Sub 3, no person shall carry on business as a short-term rental accommodation operator unless the short-term rental accommodation being provided is the principal residence unit of that person. The letter specifically stipulates that the basis for the suspension was due to the licensee failing to satisfy the principal residence requirement for the premises. There is a definition uh, of principal uh, residence unit in the license bylaw, and I'll read that for the panel now. A principal residence unit means the usual dwelling unit where an individual lives, makes their home, and conducts their daily affairs, including without limitation, paying bills and receiving mail, and is generally the dwelling unit with the residential address used on documentation relating to billing, identification, taxation, and insurance purposes, including without limitation, income tax returns, medical services plan documentation, driver's licenses, personal information, vehicle registration and utility bill, and for the purposes of this bylaw, a person may only have one principal residence unit. The uh, witness on behalf of the Chief License Inspector uh, today is the City's Deputy Chief License Inspector, Mr. Koji Miyagi. He will take you through the materials in the evidence book and explain the basis for the Chief License Inspector's decision to suspend the business license. What the panel can expect to hear is an indication that the decision required a weighing of the claim of principal residency by the licensee against a number of other factors, uh, namely a high booking volume, uh, an admission with respect to long-term absence from the unit, an admission with respect to moving out of the unit in May 2022, uh, admissions with respect to alternative housing for long-term purposes, uh, and uh, the fact that the listing uh, was listed for long-term bookings uh, in and around September uh, 2022. That's uh, something that the panel can take into consideration. There was also an inspection of the premises uh, prior to the decision to suspend, uh, and it was indicated that the residence was uh, cleared of any uh, personal effects while being offered for short-term rental accommodation. The Chief License Inspector's uh, submissions to the panel is that the conclusion that the evidence did not support principal residency was a reasonable one, uh, that the suspension of the license logically flows from that, and that the decision to suspend uh, should be upheld. Uh, of course, the licensee has the opportunity this evening to convince the panel uh, otherwise. Before embarking on the evidence, Mr. Miyagi, there uh, are some legal and procedural uh, issues to note. Uh, first, the Chief License Inspector's power to suspend the business license is set out in Section 277 of the Vancouver Charter. Uh, that reads, the Chief License Inspector shall have the power at any time summarily to suspend for such period as he or she may determine any license if the holder of the license has 
in the opinion of the inspector, been guilty of such gross misconduct uh, or with respect to the license premises as to warrant the suspension of the license. Uh, the city's submission is that the short-term rental of the property um, that, uh, that falls outside of the regulations with respect to the principal residency requirement would amount to gross uh, misconduct. Uh, furthermore, in the chart of this council's powers to review uh, a business license suspension is further set out in that section, uh, being that any person whose license has been suspended under this section may appeal to the council in accordance with the procedure for that purpose prescribed by bylaw. And upon such appeal, the council may confirm or may set aside such suspension on such terms as it uh, may think fit. Uh, the panel's power to review a business license are set out uh, further in section 275 of the Vancouver Charter. Uh, the granting or refusing, and I'm just reading that now, uh, the granting or refusing of a license to an applicant, therefore, and the revocation or suspension of a license which has been granted shall be deemed to be in the discretion of council, and the council may grant, refuse, revoke, or suspend a license without stating reasons, therefore, save in respect of a license, license, licensee who, uh, by reasonable efforts, could not be found. Uh, the council shall not revoke a license without giving the holder thereof an opportunity to be heard. Uh, and that opportunity uh, to be heard uh, is part and parcel of this evening's uh, proceedings. Uh, but under that, uh, under that section, uh, this panel has broad powers to revoke, suspend, or uphold uh, a business license. Uh, this is an administrative proceeding, so rules of natural uh, justice uh, do apply, including that opportunity to be heard. Uh, but also the license holder is entitled uh, to hear the allegations against them. They may respond to those allegations. Uh, they may ask questions uh, of the witnesses, and they may make submissions on their own behalf, including the provision of any uh, further materials that they see fit. Uh, if this uh, panel, though, sees fit to uphold the suspension, overturn it, uh, uh, or overturn it and stipulate conditions to be attached to the business license, because that's also an option, um, the law does state that you must give reasons uh, for doing so. Uh, that's a uh, Supreme Court of Canada decision of Regina and uh, Vavilov. Uh, those are uh, the opening remarks. Um, from this point, the city will call uh, the evidence of its uh, only witness, Mr. Koji Miyagi. Welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, panel. Uh, thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, my name is Koji Miyagi. I am the Deputy Chief License Inspector for the City of Vancouver. I am also the Assistant Director of Community Standards, uh, and that is an area in the Development, uh, Buildings and Licensing uh, Department. Uh, I oversee three uh, enforcement branches and one being uh, called proactive enforcement. That area oversees the, uh, uh, the enforcement, the, uh, the compliance, the investigation for short-term rental license issuance. And the information provided here today in your evidence package uh, was created uh, uh, from my staff and our area. Thank you. And you're familiar then, Mr. Miyagi, uh, with the property at number 802, uh, 183 Creefer Street? Through the chair, yes, yes, I am. And you had some involvement with respect to enforcement activities at this premises dating back to around 2021? Y yes, uh, I go through the dialogue and uh, we do triage on the case files, and so I am familiar with this. Okay. This um, uh, particular matter uh, deals with a short term rental license that was issued to registered property owner Ms. Uh, Ms. Kochar, and I understand uh, that uh, licenses were issued with respect to this premises and that owner um, as early as 2020. Is that right? Yes, Mr. Chair, that is correct. Uh, she has had, uh, I, I believe, three licenses with us. Uh, with When I say us, I'm referring to the City of Vancouver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mianchi. I, uh, I further understand that at tab two of the materials, uh, your staff has set out uh, a, a timeline of the events with respect to um, the activities, uh, enforcement or otherwise, uh, with respect to short-term rental at Unit 802-183 Kiefer, uh, Kiefer Place. Yes, through the chair and for the purposes of uh, members of the panel, um, if it's not tabbed, it's page five. 
Um, and uh, yes, our, our staff, my staff have, uh, uh, who have investigated this case file has laid out uh, the timelines of the activities that we have uh, engaged uh, Ms. Kuchar. Uh, I'm just taking it from the top then, and perhaps I'll ask the panel members uh, to turn to that page five under tab two, uh, and we'll start going through that timeline events, and you can explain um, how it is we were at the stage that we are, uh, are at this evening. Uh, I see at the, be at the beginning um, uh, reference to land title office um, records show that Ms. Uh, Kochar, the licensee, uh, became a co-owner of the property uh, September 9th, 2019. Through the chair, yes, uh, that's what our information reflects, uh, and, and that information is in the in the uh, in the evidence package. Uh, Here, she rented a, a place in um, uh, Abbott prior to uh, uh, purchasing this uh, eight hundred two one eighty three Kiefer place. Okay. We'll we'll get to that uh, that Abbott uh, residence, uh, but shortly after the uh, the land title was registered on September 9th, um, well, about a year later, uh, there was an application uh, by Ms. Uh, Ms. Kochar for a short-term rental license. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, through the chair, that is correct. Uh, she's applied for uh, license in, on, on September 29th, uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, later on, we'll talk about her booking acti activities, but uh, they, they start shortly thereafter. Okay, you say September 29th, but the timeline says September 18th was... 29th in error? Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the issuance on the, um, on the business license. It, it could be when she printed it out. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at, you're referring to the, to the 2020 business license uh, that's at page 16 under tab 4. That's correct. Okay. What I can take from the discrepancy in those dates uh, is that it was applied for on September 18th and then issued and printed out on September 29th by, uh, by staff. That is correct. Yeah, the the Amanda system would would have registered it on the eighteenth. Okay. The um, uh, the indication here was that there was no formal license application review. What does what does that mean? So at the time of issuance, uh, the the licenses are uh, self generated, if you will. They they apply online, and and they follow the instructions that are online, and then uh, if they check the appropriate uh, the boxes and and and, um, and then pay the fee then um, the licenses are issued automatically to that individual uh, and the reference to that statement is that uh, um, given the, our staff limitations as well we and we want to expedite uh, the issuance of the license uh, we don't necessarily uh, review or audit each application to its detail so there's an automatic issuance if, uh, if the application is complete and the, and the fee is paid. To the chair, yes, yes, and it's a self-declaration application process, and so we uh, uh, we we state fairly clearly in there that you must provide truthful information. The um, uh, the next note uh, in the timeline of events is that uh, there was a renewal of that uh, business license for the next year, being 2021. Uh, through the chair, yes, that is correct, uh, and and this one was, uh, uh, and it's frequent that people will will renew uh, prior to the end of the year, and uh, the next date entry, March twenty seventh, two thousand and twenty one. Uh, it appears as though it was flagged uh, for a complaint received through Van Connect. What is Van Connect? Uh, through the chair, Van Connect is uh, uh, it's it's tied to our three one one system. It's an ability for the public to uh, uh, online complain, uh, lodge a complaint, uh, and so uh, uh, through that Van Connect uh, uh, service that we have to the public, uh, we received a complaint uh, pertaining to this address. And uh, the complaint uh, is pulled uh, verbatim. Uh, in quotes being that uh, the unit at 802-183 Kiefer Place uh, was not the primary residence of the owner? Yes, that is correct. Uh, they can cite a number of things. In this particular case, the, the complaint specifically said that they, uh, that they believe that the individual that's running the short-term rental at that particular address uh, does not live there and hence does what do not. You, what did you do when you got that complaint or what did staff do? So for, for all complaints, uh, uh, the, the staff will receive them uh, and, and then we will uh, 
look into them. We will start an investigation on them. Um, we will create a case file and then and start a review process. And uh, I see here that uh, it was flagged for license audit. Uh, an audit is something that's authorized under the license bylaw um, for a chief license inspector to conduct uh, to verify things such as um, uh, establishing the principal residency requirement. Yes, through the chair, uh, that is a uh, uh, one of the very first steps that we take when when we have a complaint, when we uh, review its uh, contents, uh, we do a uh, we we call it internally a, a stage one uh, or a phase one audit, which is a uh, uh, request for documentation, and it is identified in the uh, uh, in the bylaw as well as in the application process. It says very clearly that. Uh, before you apply, please have all your documents uh, in place. So therefore, when we ask for them, that you can provide it fairly quickly. And so, so that was the first steps that we've done. Uh, and I read the definition of principal uh, residence from the license bylaw, uh, and it too uh, indicates certain documentation that may be acceptable. Are those the types of documents that, that you request through the audit process? Yes, through the chair, there, there are examples provided, uh, and uh, we, we ask for government issuance uh, uh, type ID, uh, preferably with a photo. Uh, we look for things like, the, as an example, Revenue Canada information. Uh, we try to look for information that is not self generated. So uh, ICPC information is, is one of the information that we also ask for. Uh, we do accept billings and those kind of information as well, but a lot of times they can be self-generated, meaning you can put down an address that you want on there. However, you know, we do look at those as well. The, um, uh, my understanding uh, is that the audit was conducted uh, that year and completed by August 31st, uh, 2021, uh, whereby the city uh, passed the audit uh, because it was satisfied uh, by the documents that were provided. Is that right? Yes, through the chair. Uh, in this particular instance, we, we looked at the information and um, uh, the individual provided the information. And uh, at, at that time, our staff were satisfied that uh, that that the documentation information uh, uh, was viable for the application. Uh, in, in other words, the documents that were provided, uh, to the extent that they were provided, they satisfied um, the chief license inspector with respect to the principal residency requirement for that unit. Yes, that is correct. Uh, and I'm just looking at tab five now, starting at um, page 19. It looks like the first, uh, that first page, page 19, uh, is a copy of the uh, Van Connect complaint. Is that right? Uh, yes, page nineteen. Sorry, um, that that is the copy of the uh, the the first complaint that we received. And then page twenty uh, through twenty two uh, would be uh, audit notification letter that was sent to the licensee. Yes, through the chair. So this is the document audit information, and it lists the uh, the types of uh, documents to send within uh, a particular time limit, time limit, 30 days. Uh, we also ask for um, an operational summary um, and then uh, booking calendars if there are any. So in this particular case, we asked for the booking calendar uh, because the license was issued um, in, in uh, uh, well, December of the previous year for, for the current year, and there would have been a number of months that uh, perhaps this uh, location was active, so therefore we asked for, for, for that information as well. Uh, and then we often ask for the, uh, if there is a property manager involved, we ask for that information as well. Okay. Uh, the, the balance of the documents look like uh, there's a booking calendar in here. There are some of those uh, invoices, uh, ICBC records, um, uh, and, and whatnot. I don't think that we need to go through all of those, but these are all of the materials under tab five that were considered with respect to that first audit in 2021. Is that right? It's through the chair. That is correct. Okay. Um, do you typically do more on an audit or is that the extent, uh, the, the 2021 audit with respect to the 2021 license? Is that, uh, is that your typical, uh, audit? That is the most frequently uh, initiated audit. Uh, it, uh, 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 although it does take time, it is 
bit more time conservative, and so we're able to 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 perform a lot more of these. So yes, uh, now uh, we do do uh, a stage two or phase two audits uh, where we actually interview. Uh, and we also um, uh, go on site and do an inspection. So, so those are those are ones that uh, uh, that we may decide to do later on, or we may decide to do uh, in conjunction with. In this particular time, we felt that uh, the the stage one uh, audit was satisfactory. Okay, so fair to say we'll, we'll call this a stage one. Sure. Uh, and a subsequent one that we'll get to will be a stage two audit. Is that yes, fair to say? That's correct. Okay. So that's uh, that's 2021. The audit was completed at the end of uh, of August. Uh, and the uh, the license uh, then was active through to the balance of the year. The next date entry, and I'm back to tab two at page five uh, of the timeline, um, has an entry for February 8th, 2022. Uh, that indicates that the license was renewed. That's the renewal for the 2022 business year. Is that right? Yes, through the chair, uh, that is correct. Uh, individuals can also renew their licenses online. Uh, and that 2022 license uh, is at page uh, 18. I've already referred to that uh, for short-term rental uh, accommodation uh, at uh, unit 802-183 key for place. That's the license? Yes, through the chair, that is the that is the license that was issued. Okay. Then, following that uh, that February date, uh, the city receives another complaint. Uh, this time, uh, May seventeenth, twenty twenty two. Through the chair, yes, uh, we received uh, uh, another complaint, uh, and uh, uh, this one again was for a unit uh, at this address, um, and uh, I'd like to add that. Uh, getting multiple complaints does certainly flag our interest. Uh, and as you'll see later on, you, you, there'll be a third complaint as well. So, so those, those really trigger the city's interest uh, frequently. We re actually receive no complaints for, for most of our licensees. And so when we receive one, we take some interest. When we receive two or three multiple complaints, then, uh, then it does trigger our interest. Okay. Um, the complaint that's referenced... I uh, enter that May 17, 2022, uh, 2022 uh, heading is uh, at tab six, page 66 uh, of the uh, materials. Is that right? Uh, yes, through the chair, that is correct. That uh, is the complaint. And this one particular uh, states that uh, um, the, the strata application or the strata permission uh, is not provided. Uh, so it's different from um, the first one where it was a non-resident um, or non-primary resident concern. This one uh, stated that it didn't have a strata. And, and if I can maybe explain what a strata uh, a permission is, short-term rentals uh, that are run out of a, a condo unit, apartments that are strata uh, stratified, uh, require permission from the strata to to indicate that uh, that activity is actually allowed in the building. And so we look for that document. Uh, and, uh, and once again, these are, these are mandatory documents. Uh, so if you're renting a place, you also need to require, uh, require per permission from your, your landlord. So similar to that, the strata documentation is also a mandatory piece that uh, um, is required. In, in this particular case, they said they don't have one. Uh, so, so that is also an interesting trigger for us to, to look into that. Okay, can you explain that? They said they don't have one. Did, was there some investigation into that before an audit was launched? Well, so the, the complaint says it's not allowed uh, by landlord or, or strata, which, which is true. And for them to state that this particular, the complainant uh, state that this particular unit doesn't have one, uh, we need to verify whether that's a... a a legitimate complaint or how that individual uh, had that information or the complainant had that information. Uh, so in order to do that, we would, uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, we, we, started, we started down the path of a phase uh, stage two audit where we will then ask for the documentation again. And, and I see that uh, under the, uh, the May 19th, 2022 uh, entry uh, for the timeline that's at the bottom of the page. Uh, there was a further request or stipulation uh, for an audit 
uh, with a 14-day deadline uh, to provide the required documentation? Yes, through the chair, uh, that is correct. And it's 14 days because it is a, a mandatory document that, that you have to have. And so, uh, granted, some of those, like like the, the billings and that, that, that information that supports your primary residency, uh, we do give some leeway to, to a bit more time. But, but similar to a permission from the landlord, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a document that is a must-have in order for you to even apply for a license. So, therefore, um, uh, we have requ requested for that documentation. And uh, in our particular review of what was... Uh, uh, yeah, so so we, we had asked for that documentation uh, uh, with the fourteen with a shorter timeline. Uh, okay, and a copy of that uh, audit notification letter for the twenty twenty two business license that's at page sixty eight uh, under tab seven in the materials. Is that right? Yes. So the audit notification letters, this would have been the second one that uh, uh, Ms. Kochar would have received. Uh, and it's, uh, it require, and it's, it's very similar, if not identical, to, um, to the one that she had received earlier. Uh, and, and, uh, and so she would have been familiar with uh, what to submit. Uh, I know that she had some... Uh, through this request, uh, we had discovered that she also has some difficulty um, obtaining the strata approval, which she had earlier. Uh, and so um, she had asked for an extension. And, and, and to her credit, she did submit it. Uh, but uh, it was interesting that she, had, uh, she hadn't received or had that uh, available in 14 days. Once again, it's something that you should have had. Uh, the, the audit was dated uh, back in... Um, May 19th, uh, the license was renewed uh, uh, December of 2021. So technically, um, when you apply for that license, you would have had five months to have that document already in place. Um, so, so that delay and request for delay also triggered uh, another point of interest for us, wondering what's the difficulty there. Uh, there was a request, though, for some more time, and, and eventually the required documentation was submitted. Is that right? Through the chair, yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, in the interim, uh, July 11th, 2022, we're on the second page of the timeline, uh, there was a third complaint that was received uh, through, uh, through Van Kinnick, I assume, uh, with respect to the unit. Is that right? Yes, uh, through the chair, that, was, uh, that is uh, correct. Uh, June 11th, I believe, was the date of the... Uh, and I'm uh, looking at yes. page 96 under tab 9. This is a, uh, a copy of that complaint? Through the chair, yes. Uh, that is the complaint. And in this particular one, it states again that this individual or this unit is, uh, does not have, uh, the, the person that's running it is not the principal residence there. Um, once again, so... Uh, this is the third complaint uh, in relatively a short period of time, and um, both cite fairly important key aspects of um, being compliant with the short-term rental license. So, uh, once again, this triggered a, a very, um, uh, it triggered a higher interest for us to, to pursue this matter a bit further. So, this being then a stage two uh, audit, uh, there were uh, those additional components uh, being an inspection of the premises uh, and, uh, and then a, uh, a follow-up interview with the licensee, correct? Yes, th that is correct. Uh, because of the third uh, complaint, but also the second complaint uh, and the fact that there was a delay in, in the documentation um, uh, and uh, just just the general dialogue that we, we had going back and forth, uh, uh, we felt it uh, warranted a further investigation of the actual, actual uh, case file. And so we proceeded on the path of uh, an inspection and uh, also an interview audit. Okay. 
Okay, I'm looking at the entry for August 2nd, 2022. It says that a property use inspector, that's a city inspector, uh, F. Cho uh, attended to the premises uh, and met with uh, the licensee. Yes, through the chair, uh, that is a property use inspector that uh, we use. Uh, that's another area of an enforcement uh, uh, compliance arm that I oversee. And uh, so uh, they work closely with uh, proactive enforcement uh, staff. And so Fiona, uh, Ms. Cho, um, went uh, on site on uh, August 2nd. And uh, the, the results of the uh, her visit, which includes pictures, uh, uh, which uh, I'm sure we'll refer to later on, um, state uh, uh, what she found. Uh, and interesting enough, in, in this August 2nd comment, our, our staff noted what uh, Inspector Cho found, but also uh, when, uh, when Inspector Cho spoke with uh, Ms. Kochar, uh, there was no, there were notes notations in her investigation file that that stated uh, that uh, uh, Ms. Kochar had indicated that uh, she doesn't live at the unit uh, that uh, she stays with her family in Surrey uh, with with the baby uh, there um, she had a, a ten month old or she has she had a ten month old baby back then it's older now but uh, but uh, um, and that dialogue and, and what we saw. Uh, in terms of the the pictures didn't quite uh, uh, coincide with what we anticipated. Uh, okay, the uh, the inspection um, by the uh, property use inspector, uh, what did uh, the property use inspector uh, discover? Yes, uh, if I can take you to page 97, um, the, the notes from the inspector on page 97 state uh, August uh, 2nd, 2002, uh, 22, compliance inspection, uh, suggested time. And it says RO, which is the, uh, the, the, the resident, uh, um, Ms. Kocher was present and she stated that, uh, that she, her husband and her 10, it's 10 year old, but it, it should be 10 month old, uh, baby live with their family in Surrey and that they do not live in this unit. Uh, and then she states, uh, the other information in terms of what she found. And if I can take you to uh, photos of, of starting at page 98, um, these are photos of a two bedroom um, unit uh, in Kiefer. Uh, if you look at page uh, uh, 102, for example, the refrigerator, uh, uh, it, uh, it, it shows that it's empty, uh, like it's virtually empty. Uh, and I, I know Ms. Co-Chair uh, has indicated the reasons for that, uh, but uh, uh, it is something that we note, uh, and uh, it's something that we see commonly for suites that are very highly, uh, virtually exclusively used for short-term rentals. Uh, if I take you to page 103, uh, the, the cupboards also indicate um, very little uh, uh, household or regular household items. Um, similar to what you may find in a, in a hotel setting with a kitchen unit. Uh, and then uh, uh, 105 is similar where we have um, uh, other, other cabinets. Uh, 106 is a storage unit. Uh, we see very little storage there for personal items. Um, and then uh, 107 uh, is a bathroom. Uh, 108, 109 are closets, uh, 110. Uh, all these units, um, we, looking at these and, and uh, uh, having a 10-month-old baby, um, I, I've raised three children myself, and I know that uh, it's virtually impossible to, to not have any baby uh, items uh, in the house, somewhere in the house. And uh, we didn't see any references to that. I know Ms. Kocher has stated some of the reasons why uh, they may not be there, but... Uh, for this particular unit, for what the inspector found, uh, we felt it, it does not follow the, the, definition, uh, the, the definition provided in, in the bylaw. Uh, so we felt this was very strong evidence uh, and also in support of some of the information that Ms. Kocher had shared with us that this is not her primary residence. Yeah, if I can just maybe uh, summarize what you said is that in, in the inspector's um, 
in the course of the inspection, there was a, an admission by Ms. Um, or by the, the licensee, Ms. Cochera, that nobody was living there, and essentially the inspector saw a condominium void of any personal effects. Through the chair, yes, that is correct. Um, so what was observed uh, by the inspector matched up with, with what the licensee had divulged to her? Yes, and, and what the complainants had indicated uh, multiple times, uh, it, start, it was starting to lean very close to what uh, was being indicated as the person does not live there. Uh, thank you. The, um, uh, the next thing that happened, uh, back to the timeline at page six, uh, was a phone audit meeting uh, completed with A. Holmes, R. Wong, uh, and the licensee. Uh, and I'm reading from that entry, concerns of the city uh, regarding principal residents uh, were discussed. First, uh, before we get to the details of that discussion, can you tell us who A. Holmes and R. Wong are? Yes, uh, through the chair, uh, Alexandra Holmes is uh, uh, a supervising coordinator uh, in our proactive enforcement area. She oversees all the uh, enforcement uh, staff that are there, the, uh, the, the folks that do the investigations and whatnot. So, so uh, Ms. Holmes uh, will conduct the, the interview audits uh, along with uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Claire Thompson, who's the manager there, she also does some of the audits. But in this particular case, uh, Alexander Holmes uh, led the interview. Uh, R. Wong, or Ray Wong, uh, is the one of the um, enforcement clerks, and uh, he participates. We always, we always have a, another individual that uh, helps to document, but also serve as uh, um, um, another point of evidence um, for, for that uh, uh, audit process. Uh, now, in the course of that uh, that interview, uh, some information was divulged to to city staff by the licensee. Can you uh, maybe just summarize some of the high points that were relevant uh, to the chief license inspector's decision? Yes, uh, through the chair, um, uh, there are indications in there uh, um, that talk about uh, uh, why she's being audited again. And, and understandably, I mean, she may, she may not be familiar with the process and, and she had gone through a, a documentation audit, but, but, uh, but she had felt uh, uh, quite uh, uh, taken back by that. And, and, and some of that dialogue is identified in page 124 um, where, where she thinks it's uh, quite ridiculous that we're, we're looking at her again and that uh, um, she feels very targeted. Um, and, and I hope I've been able to explain that, that that's not the case, that we are following complaints, uh, and it's a standard process, uh, and, uh, and, and the information that we've gathered have triggered our, our investigative interest, and so it's through our, uh, code of conduct that we need to follow through on this. Um, some of the other, uh, interesting key points, uh, that if I may raise is, um, she, she refers to in the interview, and it's captured by both individuals, uh, uh, Ray and uh, uh, Alex, that, uh, that she refers to Unit 613 uh, of um, 555 Abbott. Uh, well, she refers to that because we asked that question um, about, uh, we, we, we noticed that uh, you also have another um, a, a condo that, uh, that is registered to you, and, and, and what, uh, what do you do with that? And, and she goes to explain uh, uh, in a summary that, that, uh, that she uses that, and, and oh, and might I add that this, this unit on Abbott is in the, on the same complex, so it's, it's like the next building uh, to the place where she is, uh, has a license for short-term rental. And this is a unit that uh, she used to live at before, uh, before she purchased 802. Um, now, she claims that she uh, retains that location to use as a, another residence. Uh, she uses it for storage. She uses it for an office space for her husband. Uh, but uh, uh, one statement or a couple of statements she's made that, uh, if I can refer to uh, page 126, uh, about the middle, um, what are the plans moving uh, forward with uh, to 613? That's what uh, Alex had asked. Um, 
and she says, move back into our unit in the fall, supposed to go back to work, uh, keep this unit as an office space, uh, uh, so on and so forth. We blocked off our MVP calendar, uh, and we don't continue in the fall. Uh, and earlier on, she states that uh, um, she is semi uh, permanent, or uh, uh, semi-permanent in, in uh, Unit 802 uh, in this conversation. And um, uh, if I can uh, take you to uh, page 127 uh, near the bottom, uh, she states, uh, when we ask about the uh, one, uh, 613 555 Abbott, she says, we move, we move out of 802 in mid-May. Uh, fridge is not stocked because of COVID. Um, uh, we're just putting people at risk with the condiments, whatnot. Empty out the closets because um, PPLs, uh, people are staying here. Uh, we use 613 at, for storage, also storage within the building, their stuff. And I don't know what you mean by nobody lives here, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, not going to leave children, uh, clothes in the, uh, for people to steal. Uh, and she, she continues to say that uh, uh, other Airbnbs, be, uh, other Airbnbs don't do that. Uh, in the next statement, this is where we also found interest to semi-permanently move everything out, only rent space out chunks at a time, optimize summer months, so on and so forth. Um, once again, uh, this indicates that uh, uh, she clearly lives somewhere else. She also stated before that she lives with her family in Surrey as well. So. So now, okay, so there's three locations where we think you might be living as a primary uh, uh, resident. And certainly the photos that we've taken, even though it's prepared for an Airbnb, she says, but then if you look at the bookings up on uh, page 27, uh, 127, that box and the rentals, uh, if I take you through the box, you can see very clearly that uh, on the first row, uh, June, July, August, September, October, that is from 2021, uh, that indicates the number of bookings. That's pretty much solid for those months. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, in May, June, July, August, September, uh, September, not so much because we canceled our license or suspended our license, but those four months are very fully, fully booked. And, and it coincides with the fact that she goes and lives somewhere else. When an individual lives somewhere else um, for these types of purposes, uh, it, it triggers a very, uh, a high concern for us that, uh, that the compliance for permanent residency is not met. Uh, Mr. Miyagi, if you could just tell us, uh, and, and maybe, maybe I just missed it, uh, where in the documents uh, the rental days are cited for, uh, for 2022. Oh, so uh, on page uh, 127, uh, on the top, uh, they're not so much the dates, but they're the rental numbers. Um, it's in a table. And then above that, uh, you'll see it broken down to number of days. And so uh, if you go to uh, page 126, it starts there. And uh, it says calendar dates received July 12th and July 22nd. So the, these are dates that uh, we had asked for the bookings. And it states all the different booking uh, total number of days uh, dating back to 2020. And we calculate very high in the summertime uh, for, for multiple years uh, in 2021 and also in 2022. Um, and, and so uh, our, uh, our thinking based on the information we receive is that, that this unit is not occupied as a primary residence. It's, uh, it's likely left vacant throughout the year. Uh, it's, it's left, uh, as a hotel, a seasonal hotel for these summer months. And, uh, and then this individual lives elsewhere, uh, either in Surrey or in this other unit uh, that, uh, that she retains. Um, and of course, individuals have the right to retain as many units as you want, I suppose, but, but you also have to then wonder uh, uh, if you should be doing short-term rentals as well. Because this kind of behavior goes against the spirit of the bylaw which we all know is that uh, uh, the housing impact in Vancouver is at a critical point and uh, as many rental units uh, that are possible to be used 
uh, is, is what the spirit of the short-term rental bylaw is. It's not intended to be run like a hotel for a big chunk of time. Uh, and this individual is also doing this, uh, not going to uh, Florida for the winter or not going to school in Europe and, and vacating for, for those reasons. But this individual uh, works in Vancouver, uh, has a resident, another residence uh, a couple of feet away or in, in the same complex and also has access to another residence in Surrey as well. And so uh, uh, through the interview uh, audit, uh, those were the, the, the situations that we came to uh, uh, to help make that conclusion for our for the chief license inspector. Are those numbers uh, that indicate the uh, the days um, of, of booking for short term rental purposes on page uh, one twenty six and one twenty seven. Where do those come from? Those come. From, uh, those are uh, they. They should have been provided by the. Uh, um, the license holders. So I believe Ms. Uh, uh, Kochar had provided um, this information or most of it. Uh, we also have a process uh, 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 through a, a software that we use that helps us calculate the, the bookings as well. And through the, the two pieces of information, we come up with these dates. A part of the document um, uh, requests uh, during the audit process or that the, the booking calendar is provided. Is that right? That is correct. So, so these uh, these numbers on page 126 and 127 reflect the booking numbers for the unit. Uh, for 2020 and 2021, they, they reflect the, the, the information that was received in the document audit in 2021. Uh, so when you refer to these pages, uh, uh, they're not numbered, but you see the... the in uh, page 31 and so so forth, Th those are calendars, uh, uh, dates, but th they go up to 2021. That's and for the earlier audit, though. This, that's correct. At page 127, we have 2022 dates. That's correct. We refer to those starting at page 127, May 2022, um, and, and it indicates how many total days there are. So 10 days in May. 22 days in June, uh, 25 days in July. Those are the number of days in each of those months that were booked for short-term rental. Uh, yes, that, that's our that's our uh, estimate, if you will. Um, it's based on the number of rentals, which is six rentals. So if we look at July 2022, six rentals, uh, which means six individual bookings. That uh, that when you calculate all of them, come up to 25 days. And those those figures came from the licensee during the document request for the 2022 audit? Yes, uh, they should have come from the document request in the second audit, which uh, uh, I'm not, I think there is uh, information in here that uh, goes back to 2022. Um, that information isn't quite clear uh, in terms of how to interpret that. Uh, I'm afraid. Uh, so we also use, uh, it's called host compliance. And there is a tab, I think, back in the, uh, page uh, 206 that uh, in the lower right-hand corner, it shows the number of documented stays. Um, and, and it reflects, uh, uh, for example, if you look at uh, page 207, uh, uh, and if you, if you look at anyone, it'll say like three documented stays on August 2022. So we take that information, documented stays reflect a number of nights that were uh, being booked. And so we take that information and correspond it with the information that, uh, that the individual has provided. Okay. And, and the numbers then that are on page 127 um, uh, are those numbers? We believe those are, are, are accurate. Okay. Um, so I'm just looking at the notes on the prior page, uh, 126, about halfway down just before uh, beginning with rental days from 2020. Uh, it looks like these are the notes of uh, one of the two interviewers. Yes. And you'd read some of these. Um, uh, and I'm just starting uh, sort of a third of the way down. Alex, this would be Alexander Holmes asking the question, uh, what are the plans moving forward uh, to 613? That's the rental apartment that was um, that was disclosed 
uh, in the course of the interview. Is that right? Yes, the uh, 555 Abbott. Uh, uh, it was also provided in the uh, ICBC history, moving history. And uh, so uh, in that initial document uh, information, that address was on there. Uh, but through our investigations and through the interview audit, uh, we were able to ascertain that uh, they, they still keep that unit. It's a rental unit for her. Um, but they still keep the unit and then use it for these purposes. Um, um, and then also it says uh, later on, it says that she lives in Surrey as well uh, so, before. So at the time of the interview, there was an indication that right now living in 613 uh, before was in Surrey. Uh, we haven't been at 802 uh, before mid-May uh, was in 802. So from that, the understanding combined with the notes of Alexander Holmes was that um, that the licensee had not been living in uh, 802 since mid-2022, correct? Mid-May. Mid-May. Uh, uh, 2022. Through the chair, that is correct. Okay, and if I look at the dates then uh, on page 127, it looks like the short-term rental numbers uh, line up with that. 10 days in May for short-term rentals is about half the month, correct? Through the chair, yes. The booking history uh, from last from 2000, uh, 2021 and 2022 okay. coincide with that behavior. And and more or less for June, July, August, um, say 80 to 90 percent uh, capacity booking uh, for short term uh, rentals on uh, on those months. Yes, that is correct. Uh, and as of the uh, as of the interview, the interview date again was. Uh, was uh, uh, August, August 18th. 18th. Yes. Uh, and for August, it looks like uh, there'd been 19 total days, so it would be the entire of the month uh, had been. So at, yes. the time, at the time of the interview, there was the uh, admission that they weren't living in the unit, they were living in the rental unit, or the licensee was living in the rental unit, um, uh, and it hadn't been occupied since mid-May. To the chair, yes, that is correct. Okay, I, I take it then that there was a conclusion that um, it wasn't being used as a principal uh, residence. Yes, the information that we gathered uh, led to that conclusion for us. Uh, all right, so um, uh, the decision was made then uh, with respect to the suspension of the license? Yes, uh, so after the conclusion of the audit uh, and then uh, looking at all the information, uh, having discussions with the uh, myself, uh, the chief license inspector, and, and the, uh, the all the investigators, uh, August thirty first, uh, a suspension letter was issued uh, by the chief license inspector, uh, stating the totality of the information obtained uh, uh, leads us to uh, believe that it does not support that this is your primary residence. All right, and that was that was communicated. Uh, in a uh, uh, suspension letter dated August 31st, uh, 2022, from the Chief License Inspector uh, to the licensee. Uh, yes. Sent by registered mail. That's at uh, tab 14 of the materials. Yes, tab 14, page uh, 192. 192, thank you. Uh, and just then, moving on to uh, the following tab, uh, 194, page 194, uh, tab 15. This is a warning letter dated September 20th, uh, 2022. Uh, can you tell us what, uh, what this letter is all about? Yes. Uh, through the chair, um, we, we frequently look for compliance after we issue a suspension letter. Uh, and the, uh, in this particular case, uh, we, we have forwarded the letter, um, August 31st, uh, we monitored the activities on the, on the website and we have uh, discovered that the listing was still up and that uh, it was uh, being advertised for 30 days or more, uh, which is considered a long-term rental. Uh, and uh, we, don't, we did not have record of uh, Ms. Kochar having a long-term rental license which is a requirement when you're renting long-term. And so therefore we sent her a warning letter saying, please cease and desist uh, this activity until you get a uh, long-term uh, rental uh, license. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, if an individual rents 
uh, or, or seeks a renter for long-term rentals, uh, that's another firm point of uh, confirmation for us that an individual that rents something for full time like that long term, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to do that if that's your primary residence. If you live there full time, how can you rent this for full time as well? And, and uh, that's, that's another point of information that we felt was very uh, uh, important to include in this evidence pack package. And it supports the decision uh, that the chief license inspector made about this uh, location not being her primary residence. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Magic. I don't have any further uh, questions. Uh, is there anything else that you want to add? Uh, through the chair, uh, I, I believe all the points were, were covered. Um, uh, and uh, I would like to once again note that uh, this particular uh, building, uh, this Kiefer, 188 Kiefer, or 183 Kiefer, uh, is a high uh, non-compliant building. Uh, I'm not saying that she is necessarily uh, because she lives there, but but we have a lot of cases that generate out of that building as well. So we do pay uh, additional uh, interest uh, and attention to that location. Um, so part of what we go through, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're fairly confident that the, the information that we provided does reflect the, the decision. Um, and uh, for the spirit of the bylaw that's intended, uh, we do feel that this location is not meeting that, that particular um, uh, intent. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manatee. Those are uh, all of my questions. Thank you. Um, panel members, do you have any questions for the witness? I mean, this, this would be for Mr. Um, Crabshee. Oh, sorry, Koji, first name, <laughs> sorry. Miami? No questions? There's nobody on, right, that's fine. Then we can move right along. Councillor Fry raised his hand. I think he may have a question. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Robert. I'm, I it's logged me out of the uh, crest on. Uh, a question for uh, 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 Mr. Miyagi. Um, the complainants, uh, since they're redacted, are, are these, uh, I'm curious, are these different complainants or is this one complainant that had uh, reported this on multiple occasions? Uh, through the chair, the uh, the complaint information uh, is redacted uh, because this is a public document, and the uh, um, how we treat complaints uh, and complaint information is is protected in the Privacy uh, uh, Act, and so um, because this document is 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 public, we we had to redact this. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I am unable to disclose that information uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, who or, or or what or if there's the same individual uh, that has complained. Uh, what I can add, though, is that uh, uh, the, this these complaints came from the building, and, and so it is uh, a resident or, or somebody that lives there, which which adds uh, a bit more credibility to the complaint. Sure. Yeah. No. And I'm satisfied with the the body of your evidence. I'm really just curious as to how these complaints work, and and you know, um, honestly, just even outside of this particular case, how how we ensure that they're not just sort of personal beefs or what have you. But I, I'm I'm satisfied with the rest of the information, the evidence you provided. So I'm I'm fine with these questions at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm wondering if at this point now, unless there's any other questions, which I don't see any hands up on that, um, if the licensee, so um, Punir, Kocher, if you have any questions uh, for Mr. Miyashi. I do, yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to be a little bit slow here because I've got a bunch of tabs open that I need to go through. Um, So to start, in the opening remarks by Mr. LeBlanc, it was stated that a high volume of bookings was a reason for the city to deem it was not my principal residence. 
Can you please clarify for the panel what the booking percentage was and what you deem as high? That to me. Uh, Ms. Kocher, yes. uh, sorry, uh, to the chair. For Mr. Miyagi. <clears throat> yes. Ms. Kocher, can we just get some clarification? Is that directed at that question directed at Mr. Miyagi? Yes, it is directed at Mr. Miyagi. Okay. Uh, sorry. So to to uh, just to get clarification, are you wanting to know what the percentage is, or or are you? Uh, wanting to know, uh, or maybe if I can get you to ask that question again. Maybe you could start with what you deem as high, a high number of bookings. You referred to that a few times in your statement. Yes, uh, through the chair, uh, high would be uh, if it's completely booked for the month, if it's, uh, uh, I guess, anything over 50%, which is, not necessarily defined in the bylaw, but uh, from a reasonable, reasonable standpoint to determine if you live, if an individual lives there full time or not, um, that uh, those numbers do fluctuate. Uh, but uh, uh, from a reasonable standpoint, uh, the numbers that uh, you've presented or that we have for your residence is considered high. So to clarify, um, <clears throat> high to you is 50%. There is no set number. But you referred to the term high, so I'd like to define what high means, because it can just be arbitrary otherwise. No, your numbers are high. What are my numbers? So we stated those in the, uh, on page 126. So on page 126 and 127, it says, um, for the initial audit, which you claimed was a stage one audit, um, there was a total number of 115 days rented, which is 32% of the year. You mentioned that 50% was high. 32% is well below 50%. Can you please confirm? I stated that 50, through the chair, I stated that 50% could be considered high. Uh, what I'd like to state, uh, again, is that your numbers that you provided are considered high uh, from, from an investigative standpoint. Okay, um, so 32% out of the year for you is high. And I'm sure you do this a lot in your line of work. Um, when you audit other um, individuals or licensees that you deem um, it is not or not compliant or this may not be their primary residence, would you say that 32% is an average of how many bookings they typically have in a year when it is not their primary residence? Through the chair, I, I can't state those numbers. Uh, I don't have those. Uh, what I can state is uh, the totality of information provided uh, leads us to, to take the numbers of bookings into consideration. And as I reiterated before, uh, we, we believe the numbers that you provided uh, for 2022 uh, which is the, uh, the license that's in question, uh, is high. Okay, so just to clarify, for 2021, it was 128 days, which is 35% of the year. And for 2022, it is 115 days, which is only 32% of the year. And from my understanding, you deem that as high, even though it is not 50% of the year which seems to be some sort of requirement. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure our strata even received notes from the city of Vancouver, which said six months is the average that the city looks at. If it's booked more than 6%, they deem it to not be their primary residence. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, no, it's not correct. That's not what I said. I, I said the totality of information that's provided. Uh, you're going with the annual average of 365 days. Uh, we're looking at the totality, the concentration, uh, the, the circumstances that you're under. Uh, we look at all those kind of things. And given the information that you provided, uh, we consider those numbers high. So I'm referring to the opening statement in which it was stated that there was a high volume of bookings quote, high volume of bookings, unquote. I'm not referring to why my license was suspended. 
I'm not referring to the totality of the information. I'm referring to that statement that was made in the opening remarks, which it said it was a reason for the city to deem it was not my principal residence. So I'm only speaking to that one reason, not the totality of the information. So can you please let me know whether you deem that 32% of the year, 115 days out of 365 days, is a high number of bookings? In your context, yes, it would be in your context, it would be high. And my context is what? It's concentrated in that period of time. Okay. So to your knowledge, um, you don't find that some licensees find it most beneficial to rent their unit or do short-term rental in their unit during busy season where which it might be um, ski season in Vancouver or it could be the summertime in Vancouver. To the chair, I can only speak to your context. And as I mentioned before, it is considered high. An individual that rents every weekend um, may have the similar numbers as perhaps what you have in totality, but in that context, that may, that may not be considered uh, uh, to support a non-residency uh, part of totality. In your context, it's concentrated, and so therefore, uh, I believe it is high. All right. Okay. So, referring back to the definition of principal residence, can you confirm that I meet all of these following requirements? I will ask them one by one. Documentation related to billing, identification, taxation, and insurance purposes. Can you confirm that my income tax returns are filed at 802-183 Kiefer Place? I could confirm that that's the information provided, yes. Can you confirm that my driver's license is issued at 802-183 Kiefer Place? I believe that is the case, yes. Can you confirm that my vehicle registered with ICBC is registered at 802-183 Kiefer Place? That is what you provided, yes. Can you confirm that my utility bills are under my name at 802-183 Kiefer Place? And once again, that is what you provided, yes. Can you confirm as a part of the definition that I am paying bills, receiving mail, and generally the dwelling unit within the residential address used on documentation related to billing, identification, taxation, and insurance purposes, including without limitation, income tax returns, medical service plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are all, I am in compliance of all of that. Through the chair, no, I cannot confirm that you pay those bills out of that particular residence. It indicates that that's what you use to, to self-declare that that's what the address you want to be sent there. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you actually do those activities there, so I cannot confirm that. I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Can you please clarify with what you mean by you're not sure I do that there? Do what there? Sorry, you're asking me if I confirm that you pay those bills there from that residence is what I understood your question to be. And, and respectfully, I cannot confirm that because I do not know where you pay your bills. Okay, can you confirm that I receive mail there and it is generally in the dwelling unit where the residential address used on documentation related to billing, identification, taxation, and insurance purposes, including without limitation, income tax returns, medical service plan documentation, driver's licenses, personal identification, vehicle registration, and utility bill. And for the purposes of this bylaw, a person, I only have one principal resident unit. All I can confirm is that that's the address that's, that is shown on the bills and the documents that you, you, that you, that you provided. Uh, I can also add that uh, an, uh, uh, an individual could place that address uh, anytime uh, without verification from the companies, but, uh, but what you provided, uh, I, can, I can see that you've, you've used that 802 address. I can't okay. confirm whether you get mail there because I don't live there. And so uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't answer those questions to the, the extent that, that, that you wish me to. Okay, so as a part of this audit, what is the purpose for the city to obtain these documents if you're telling me that you can't confirm that information anyway? It's provided in good faith, and, uh, uh, and uh, 
the totality of information uh, is then taken into consideration in terms of what we as investigators think uh, is if it is provided in good faith or not. From the definition, can you please specify what specifically I did not satisfy for the city? Uh, I believe uh, uh, we explained this uh, through the questions that Mr. LeBlanc had provided. It's stated in the letter by the Chief License Inspector as well. Okay, I can go back to the letter and read it again. Give me a second. So it says that um, I did not satisfy. So it said the information received from the community, the compliance inspection and inf information from the meeting, the information did not support that 80213 Kiefer is my principal residence. Can you please clarify what specific information you received did not satisfy it as my principal residence? Uh, through the chair, the, the, the questions that uh, Mr. LeBlanc took us through, uh, took me through, uh, I believe more than clearly identified what we felt was relevant. So you had stated that um, you feel that um, I use 802 Kiefer, 183 Kiefer Place, uh, I leave it empty for the remainder of the year and only use it for the summer months. Is that correct? That's why the city deemed that it was not my primary residence? Through the chair, uh, once again, it is the totality of information. It's information that you provided, information we collected, uh, information that we've uh, 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 gathered and uh, looked at. Uh, all the information that we were explaining through this uh, uh, hearing just prior to you questioning me uh, is what we felt was relevant. Okay, so if you determined that 802 183 Keeper Place is not my principal residence, then what is the city determined is my principal residence? Or has that, or has the city determined that I don't have one? Through the chair, that, that's outside of the realm of, of what the city needs to, to determine. We're trying to identify whether uh, your uh, short-term rental license application meets the compliance requirements of the bylaw. Uh, so I, it's not our position to, to state where, where you live. Okay, so you don't believe that, or you have not found that, um, 613 Abbott Street is my primary residence or somewhere in Surrey is not my primary residence. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. What we're saying is that uh, 802, uh, 183 Kiefer Place is not uh, your primary residence as per the definition uh, of obtaining a short-term rental license. We don't, so think, you, we don't think you're in compliance. Okay, so when you came to that conclusion, as a part of your investigation, where is it that you deem that I stay for um, eight months out of the year? Through the chair, through, the, uh, th through what you've indicated, you stated that you stay uh, with your mother in Surrey, and, and, and we've been through this before. Uh, you also indicated in the audit that that you live at uh, uh, 613 555 Abbott Street. That's what you've indicated. We've indicated that uh, uh, in this proceedings. Okay, I'll get to that in a minute. To the best of your knowledge, do I own any other properties besides 802183 Kiefer Place? I only know the information that's in the evidence package. Is it typical uh, for your for the city in, as a part of their process to do a title search on any other addresses that they have on file for um, a licensee? Through the chair, that is not uncommon. 
So did you do a title search on 613 Abbott Street? Uh, we did a, a property. Well, the information that we provided that we did is in the package. It's a yes or no question. Did you do a title search for 613 Abbott Street? We did a property report. Uh, so if it's not in the package, then, then, then I would have to assume no, it's not. So to confirm, you did not do a property search, a title search for 613 Abbott Street? Uh, if it's not in the package. On August 31st, uh, it was determined that the audit, uh, August 31st, 2021, it was deemed that the audit was completed, the initial stage one, uh, the audit that you referred to as stage one. When does the city decide or determine, what's the process for the city to determine whether a stage one or a stage two audit is necessary? Uh, as indicated earlier, uh, we have various means to look at that. Uh, a complaint could trigger that. Uh, we could randomly select one. Um, uh, the bylaw states that, uh, uh, that the city has the, the right to look at those or, or, or ask for documentation anytime. And so therefore that's what we do. So when you received the first complaint, um, which is on Sorry, it's not easy having this all just electronic. So um, on March 27, 2021, the city received a, their first complaint that the unit is not the primary residence. Typically, when you receive that sort of complaint, would you conduct a stage one or a stage two audit? We may. That doesn't answer my question. Would you like me to repeat my question? Well, you asked typically, do we do that? And uh, our response is we may. Um... No, my question was, typically when you receive a complaint that a unit is not somebody's primary residence, would you conduct a stage one or a stage two audit? I guess the response is, uh, it, it depends on what we uh, deem um, as what we need to look into. Complaints certainly trigger an investigation. Uh, and. And then as we go through that, it may lead to a stage uh, two uh, audit, uh, interview audit. It may end at uh, uh, interview uh, or a document audit, that's stage one. Um, we follow the bylaw and we're very careful how we follow the bylaw. And so um, I, I, I'm not sure if you're thinking we're targeting you. Uh, is, is that where this is going? Maybe I shouldn't ask these questions. So, so I'll just leave it to, to just to say we follow the, the audit or the bylaw. So based on the information that you received, as well as the complaint, what made you determine that uh, a stage two audit was not required in my case? In 2021? Correct. So we, we received the information and uh, at that time, uh, I can't speak for the investigators, I'm, I'm not at that ground level, uh, but they felt uh, that that was satisfactory. Can you confirm what it was that they felt was satisfactory? I'm sorry, I just stated that I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not at that ground level where they do these uh, reviews and so uh, they must have felt uh, that what, what you provided was satisfactory at that time. Were you not provided the information or the file for that audit? It's a document audit. We do, we do many of those. We do uh, thousands of those. And so I don't see each one of those. Uh, the ones that are elevated to me are, are in uh, these circumstances where uh, we have situations where we go through uh, an interview audit or uh, we suspect that there's no compliance. 
So as a part of this audit evidence package, we refer you refer to um, the 2021 audit. So if we're referring to that audit, why have we not gathered information um, about that audit? So, sorry, uh, we, the 2021 document audit? Is, yes. is that what you're asking? Yes. And are you asking why we didn't go further in that particular case? No, you mentioned you're not familiar with that audit. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it was that um, whoever was conducting that audit, they obviously deemed that I satisfied um, that this 80213 key for place was in fact my primary residence. So I'm wondering, um, are you familiar with the notes of that file where um, the auditor for that or whoever was collecting that information, why they deemed that no further investigation was necessary? Because it is a complaint about my primary residence. It's no different than the complaints that are received later on. That was your first complaint. Uh, we trigger multiple complaints as uh, 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 a point of interest uh, in your particular case. Um, Perhaps you were lucky. I, I I don't know the details of that, so I can't speculate. So are you stating that I was lucky because there are loopholes in the city's audit process? No, I'm how not. Does luck, how does luck play into this? No, I'm not. So can you please clarify what you mean by I was lucky? I said perhaps you were lucky because the can point I made is that I do not know to the detail of each uh, document audit. We do thousands of these. We have over 3,000 license holders, and uh, we have many applications that, that we review. So um, you have to understand that, uh, and I hope you understand, that uh, not every piece of paper comes across my desk. I know. I'm not asking about every single piece of paper. I'm referring to my hearing, and my hearing has the 2021 audit report and audit documentation, and we've referred to the audit in 2021 many times in my specific hearing. So obviously, I would like it if you were informed on the 2021 audit process. And I'm just going to conclude here that you think in the 2021 audit, I perhaps got lucky. Can you please confirm? No, that is not what I said. So no, I'm not confirming that. I am familiar with your 2021 audit because it is part of a, a bigger uh, process here. So yes, of course, I am familiar with that. Uh, if you're asking if I was familiar at that time that it was done in 2021, no, because we do thousands of those. And so it would be unrealistic for me to, to, to look at every uh, document that comes across my desk. I will clarify for you. I never asked whether you were familiar with my file at that time. I'm asking if you're familiar with my file present day. Yes, of course I am. Perfect. I'll ask my questions again then. Can you please confirm? why the inspector or the auditor in the 2021 audit, um, A. Menzi, I believe his name was, um, what was his reason for feeling that I satisfied um, the primary principal residence um, uh, by I'm going to interject with this question. At this point, we've been over this territory a number of times. The question is causing Mr. Miyagi to speculate as to why somebody else did something else, uh, and that's not a, a proper question. Mr. Miyagi's already said he has no knowledge of why. The yeah, he also passed. went on to say that I, I just got lucky. So. Again, I think okay. he's speculating, and that's an improper question. Okay, so, all right. So, just so I understand correctly, nobody knows why in 2021 my principal residence status was satisfied. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. Okay, can you please tell me why it was satisfied? Why this auditor deemed that I 80213 Keeper Place was in fact my primary residence? Again, the question asks for speculation on the part of Mr. Miyagi. He's already answered that question. He doesn't know. I'm confused. Uh, you're saying something else, Mr. LeBlanc, and Mr. Miyagi is answering the question as if he knows the answer. So I, I'm a little bit confused. Maybe I'll ask for the chair to... Uh, direct what happens with that particular question. Okay, um, that question has been asked. Um, 
Uh, yes, yeah, excuse me, that question has been asked of Mr. Mayachi. He has confirmed um, an answer to you, uh, which is at that time that file um, was one that he, uh, there's many thousands of those kinds of files, and that is not something that has escalated the point of his involvement, which is what is happening now. Um, so um, I will confirm uh, that, um, that the, uh, th that, um, um, Mr. LeBlanc's point, which is um, that the uh, you have received uh, an answer uh, uh, to your question that is a um, may not satisfy you, but it is an answer, and it is the um, uh, only answer at this point in time. You can, you know, repeat the question is not going to get you a different answer. So you should move on with your questions. Sounds great. I just want to make sure that the panel understands that Mr. Maiji thinks that I just got lucky with that first audit. So I'll change my question back to, can you please clarify what the process is of determining whether a stage one or a stage two audit is um, required? Because, or, or maybe you could just clarify for me, is it true that a stage two audit is triggered when more than one complaint is received? Mr. Yes, yeah, through the chair, in your case, yes. In my case, yes, okay. So when I res when a second complaint is submitted for any any um, license fee hold license holder, uh, a stage two audit um, audit will automatically be uh, conducted. Through the chair, that's not what I said. Okay, so can you please clarify what the city's process is on deciding whether a stage one or a stage two audit is required? Through the chair, uh, I've been through this before. Uh, we look at the totality of the information that's provided to us. And so when we look at, in your particular case, there was enough uh, concern for us to go to a stage two audit. Can you confirm what the concern specifically was at the time that the stage two audit was conducted, was uh, commenced? Through the chair, I, I believe we covered all that uh, through the questioning from Mr. LeBlanc. Do you mind repeating it? I don't. I don't remember that information. Uh, Madam Chair, do we need to go through the whole proceedings here? Um, no, I don't believe so. Um... Yeah, I, I, we, we did actually cover those questions. It's absolutely true. And at the time that we were that that uh, we were proceeding with the detailed um, timeline mm -hmm. and events that happened, um, you know, in this particular here uh, related to this particular hearing. Um, so actually, if you could just um, uh, focus on a, a new uh, requirement or questions that may result in new information or information that you didn't understand, it would be a better focus. Thank you. Sure. When you received um, a complaint that this, that I did not have Strata's approval or the landlord's approval to operate a short-term um, rental in that uh, unit, how would you say, in your professional opinion, somebody would be aware of that sort of information unless they were privy to private and confidential information about an owner? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear what you're asking. I, I don't know if you're asking me to speculate. My professional opinion, uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe if you can, uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, maybe you can just reframe that question. It, it might be helpful. Sure. The complaint that was submitted on for, um, against me was that I don't have Strata's approval to operate a short-term rental. Now, I'm just trying to understand why anybody or how anybody would have that information about me. It's very personal and private. So I don't I believe that somebody would need to be in a place of power or privy to be able to, to, to have that information. Now, it's been, I've been told that the Strata works, the Strata Council works closely with the city to let the city know 
whether people are in compliance in this building. Um, so I'm wondering, and I know you can't disclose, I guess you can't disclose any information about the complainant, but as uh, Mr. Fry pointed out earlier, there are a lot of, a lot of beefs in this building because you have a large number of a group of people that want that that authorize and it's been voted on many times at our AGMs whether short term rentals are should be allowed in our building or not there is a handful of people that are very anti short term rentals in our unit so the city will often will probably receive a lot of falsified complaints about um short term rental operators because there is this vendetta that um, they're trying to get all of them banned in our building or prevent everybody from doing a short-term rental in our building. So anyway, that's there's no question there. So I'm going to move on to say, um, to ask, when uh, you received all of the documentations um, that were re requested, again, even though I had mentioned to Ray in my phone, co phone conversations as well as my email correspondences to him that I feel targeted and why am I being audited for a second time in a nine month time frame? He had said that they received a complaint and you needed to satisfy whether it was my principal residence and you required additional documents, uh, the same exact documents that I provided nine months ago, except this time dated for 2022, which I provided. And then you also needed a letter from the strata, strata which I also provided. So I had satisfied um, the strata approval letter, the strata approval, which is what the complaint was. So after you deem that the complaint was false and misleading and in fact um, incorrect, what made you um, decide that a further investigation was necessary? An audit had already been conducted and a city employee had already just determined that 802-183 Keeper Place is my principal residence. Then somebody complained that, oh, she doesn't have approval. You received that approval letter. You received all of the documentations about it being my principal residence or dated for the new year. What was missing in the information that you received that, that caused you to further investigate? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, if there's a qu that question in there, um, you did not have your strata authorization when you had applied, renewed your license. And so we asked for that information. Actually, I did have my strata um, authorization letter. Uh, it's just that when you would ask for it again, you said that even though it's late in 2021 and it hasn't been 12 months yet since I received that letter, I needed a new one that was dated for 2022. That is why I did not have that uh, license, and it should be in the email thread and the evidence between Ray and I. And you also mentioned earlier in your questioning, when uh, in your statements to Mr. LeBlanc, that it was it triggered your interest, or you found it in interesting that I needed an extension to obtain this uh, strata authorization letter. Can you please clarify what you mean by that was interesting? Yes, because you didn't have the authorization letter. The letter was dated June, uh, if I recall cor correctly. Uh, you had renewed your license in December. Every uh, renewal is considered a new license uh, in, in terms of when your information uh, could be asked. It's, uh, your circumstances could change. Um, uh, so granted, it's a renewal, but it, it is a new license. And so the information uh, is, is up to the city and the city reserves the right to, to ask when we feel uh, is, is, uh, uh, is important for us to know. And in your particular case, uh, you didn't have that uh, strata uh, approval. You asked for an extension in, in obtaining that. Um, and, uh, and so that was interesting. So um, in your, on your website or in the bylaws or any rules that you have, does it state that um, every calendar year you require a new license, uh, a new letter from your strata? 
Through the chair, we follow the bylaw. The bylaw says if you apply for a license or, or if you receive a business license, it says here, uh, 14A, short-term rental accommodation operator shall provide documentation or records that demonstrate compliance to this bylaw to the chief license inspector upon request, including but, li but not limited to. And it talks about uh, documents for short-term rental that prove your principal residence as Section A. Uh, Section B states proof of strata authorization if the short-term rental accommodation is in a strata lot. Uh, you applied for a new license in 2022, so we follow the bylaw section uh, 14B. I'm going to repeat my question. In the bylaw, does it state that a new letter from your strata is required each calendar year? Uh, through the chair, I, I believe I answered that question. The bylaw states uh, uh, the city can ask for these documents. Right, but does it state that a new letter is required? Because you just, you deemed that, oh, at the, at any call, any time that you felt you, it was necessary, you can call upon me and I should present this letter. And I did present a letter to you, except you, saw, you felt that well, that one's from June 2021, so you wanted a new one. Where in the bylaws does it say that you needed you need to present a letter dated for every new calendar year? Uh, through the chair, that's not what I said. And uh, uh, if I can add, the 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 individuals being argumentative here, and I, I'm not quite sure how to answer some of these questions. I've, I've already stated uh, the responses that, in my opinion, cover her uh, question. Okay, perhaps you can um, move on to another line of questioning if you have one. Um, I think that'd be appreciated, Ms. Bocher. Sure. I'm just going to end that by uh, Mr. Maggi said that it was interesting that I needed an extension. I needed an extension to obtain that strata authorization letter. Nowhere in the bylaws, nowhere on the city's website is it, is it clear that I need to get a new license every time I apply for a, a new letter every time I apply for a short-term rental license that's dated for that calendar year, which is why I didn't have it and which is why there was a delay. Also, if you refer to the email thread between Ray and I, you'll see that my strata was very, very slow in responding to me. Um, and I even provided uh, an email thread between me and my strata uh, management company to prove that they weren't responding to me and I had emailed them three different times. So that is why, that's what the reasoning for me not being able to meet that 14-day deadline was. Through, through, I, the, through the chair, uh, it does say, and I stated this earlier, uh, it's very clear on the website that you must have all your documentations uh, ready to present when you apply. It says that right on the website when you apply. So it is on there. And uh, the strata documentation is one of the documents that says you, you have to have. So it is on there. Uh, so when you apply for your 2022 license, uh, you should have had that. And I did provide you with the strata approval letter. You just deemed that it wasn't uh, valid for that year. Well, you provided a 2021 dated one. It was less than 12 months old, yes. It was for the 2021 license. This is for the 2022 license. Right, and, and all I'm saying is that it's not clear on your website or in the bylaw that a new license, a new letter is required from Strata every calendar year. Now I know, and I will make sure that anytime I apply for a new license, I get a letter from the Strata. I'll move on. As you have further questions? I do, yes. Okay. You mentioned that it uh, triggers your interest, triggers your interest when you receive multiple complaints. How do you determine if a complaint is viable and it's not a disgruntled strata council member, a neighbor, or someone that doesn't want anyone to do STR in the building? Through our investigation, we... Uh, you investigate the complainant? No, through the chair. We investigate what the complaint says. So to confirm, if I filed a complaint about my neighbor 
every three months, can you confirm that every three months the city would investigate them? We would investigate, as I mentioned before, we respond to every complaint that's received to us, we look at it, and then, and then we follow through to the best of our ability. So your answer is yes, you would um, investigate every three months if I filed a complaint about my neighbor. Great. Sorry, is that a is that a question? No. Nope. So once the city confirmed that the complaint was in fact incorrect, and as a matter of fact, I did have Strata's approval, and I was allowed to operate STR in my unit. Why was the audit not completed at that point? Especially since an audit of whether the unit is my primary residence or not was just completed a few months prior. That is part of our choice to investigate further. And in this particular case, we felt that it was important to, to follow through on, a, uh, on an interview audit. So can you please clarify uh, what um, it is that helps you make that decision? Yes, as stated in the letter, it's uh, from the Chief License Inspector, it's the totality of the information. The totality of the information to clarify was a, I am in compliant and the complaint was invalid about whether I'm allowed to operate or not. And B, uh, my primary residence had already been confirmed a few months prior by a city member. So with that information, I was compliant in both of those complaints. You still felt that further investigation was necessary, correct? Through the chair, we uh, uh, we noted the the on-site uh, um, uh, uh, I was going to say investigation the the the, the on-site visit by our inspector. Uh, th it's the totality of information, uh, and and there's things that you've indicated about you not living there. Uh, as I as I mentioned earlier in the in the. Uh, um, cross uh, questioning by uh, Mr. LeBlanc. All this has been answered. Um, so. Uh, You're actually not answering my question because I'm not referring to things that were um, uh, identified as a part of your audit once you had already decided to go further. I'm asking why it was that you went further because as far as I can see, all of the information provided to the city should have satisfied the complaint and the pr principal residency because it was a city member, um, somebody that had conducted an audit already felt that it was my principal residence. Uh, they did their job as a part of the first complaint and I had satisfied the second complaint, which was that I wasn't allowed to operate. The strata had didn't give me permission to operate. So I had satisfied both of those complaints. So what was it that was left that the city needed to figure out? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the inspection uh, triggered questions. Uh, the comments that you made at the inspection triggered questions, um, which then were verified in the audit. Uh, the, the, the duration of, it's, it's all in the evidence package. And so, uh, Madam Chair, I, I, I don't know if I need to go through this again. I think that the, the, these uh, questions um, do seem to be repetitive. So if you have a, a, you know, another set of questions or a different question to ask, I, I encourage you to, um, to move to that because um, I think the question has been reframed a number of times by, by yourself and uh, the same answer is given. So uh, I think moving to, to something new um, or a, a different um, uh, set of inquiries you might have would be uh, useful at this time. Sure. Can you please uh, tell me what the purpose is of a compliance uh, inspection, which in my case was completed by Ms. Cho? So, so the, the, sorry, the, the purpose of why do we do the inspection? Yes. Yes. So we, we want to see if, if you are uh, compliant to the bylaw. Compliant to the bylaw of whether it's my principal residence? Yes. 
Okay. If you ref can you refer to page um, 170 second. Page 176. Let me know when you're there and I'll continue. I am there. So in an email from Fiona Cho, who is the compliance inspector, it says in the email, hi, Puneet, further to our telephone conversation, please be reminded that the bylaw compliance inspection has been scheduled for Monday, July 25th, 2022 at 1030 a.m. For your reference, I will be looking for the following. Fire extinguisher on every floor, if applicable. Unit 802 fire exit plan with contact information sheet and muster point, smoke detector, carbon monoxide detectors, no key, key lock, locks or deadbolts on any interior doors, work without permit if any, bylaw compliance include but may not limit be limited to license bylaw, zoning and development bylaw, Vancouver building bylaw, parking bylaw, standard of maintenance bylaw and noise control bylaw. Can you please show me where in Ms. Cho's email she mentioned that she was coming in for uh, to determine whether I was in compliance with the primary, with whether um, this unit is my principal residence. So uh, number six does that. Can you confirm which bylaw? It's a licensing bylaw. Okay. So in her um, uh, inspection, can you confirm what the purpose is of taking photographs of the unit? That's our common practice. If it's your common practice, why is it that you don't list them out like you do? Hey, we're going to look for a fire extinguisher. We're going to look if you have a smoke detector. Why do you not say that um, they're going to take pictures? And why do you not say state whether um, we're going to check to see if this is your principal residence? Uh, once again, we, we've indicated, Fiona has been very clear on point six, that uh, we look for bylaw infracts or compliance. That, that's what it states. How we conduct our bylaw uh, inspection is up to us. So um, if you're asking why we didn't tell you, in advance, um, that's not our, uh, how we conduct our inspection is how we conduct our inspections. But you do mention um, the need for all of the other items, like a smoke detector or making sure that there's no key locks. Um, you know, make, hey, we're letting you know, make sure you don't have any work without permit there. Uh, but it's interesting to me that you leave out this one item where you're also checking to see, hey, um, is this your principal residence? Um, I, I just find that very interesting. Um, um, Ms. Kojar, this is not actually closing comments by you. Some of the points you're making now may well be points you wish to raise as to what, what is interesting to you or not in your closing comments. This is specifically to ask questions, so I um, ask you to just focus on that, please. Okay, sorry, my apologies. I'm not familiar with these proceedings, so I can save my comments for the end if that's how it works. Yes. Continue with my questions. Um, Mr. Manji, can you confirm if the conversations are recorded? Um, in the, as a part of the inspection? The on-site inspection or, or? Yeah, yes. They're not recorded. They're not recorded. So um, in her findings, Ms. Cho um, states that I have a 10-year-old 
uh, which is incorrect. Uh, and um, as a part of her inspection, she doesn't state whether I have keyed locks um, or dead bolts, uh, but rather it refers a lot to a lot of my personal information. Um, can you confirm that that's um, in fact what e this compliance inspection is uh, intended for? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not clear what you're asking me. Are you, are you asking me if Fiona made a mistake about the the ten year old baby? No, I'm asking um, whether you were wondering if I had a smoke detector in my um, in my unit, or whether that was of importance to you. It's part of the inspection process. If Fiona states those items, then that's one of the things that she would have looked at. They just don't include it in their findings? Or it's not important to be included in the findings? I'm sorry, are, are, are you saying that, that you have a fire, uh, fire um, alarm and, 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 and she, didn't, she didn't mention that? Is that what you're asking me? Sorry for clarification. Um, no, what I'm uh, asking is, um, I've get, been given a very specific list of items that uh, I need to ensure I'm doing in order to be compliant. But when I look at the findings uh, of Ms. Cho, I see that um, some of the items are just not mentioned in the findings. As a matter of fact, there's a lot more information about my personal life than there is about um, the five items that she had listed. Uh, in her email to me. The question again causes Mr. Miyagi to speculate as to why the note taker did or didn't include certain things in her report. He can't speak for the inspector. Okay. Uh, do you have further questions, Ms. Kocher? I do, yeah. Sorry. I'm just trying to filter through my questions of where it might be causing uh, Mr. Maiji to speculate. So I'm just filtering through those. Okay, I think that's all I have for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, for that, panel members, do you have any uh, question? Sorry. Yes, do you have any questions? Ms. Kocher. Or actually, you're, first I should ask if you're going to call any witnesses or not. Me? Yes. No, unfortunately okay. not. Okay, that's fine. Um, panel members, then, do you have any questions? Mm, that would be for the witnesses. No, no, no witnesses. Is there an opportunity then for questions of the panel members to Ms. Kocher? Uh, this is not in this, not in this list of maybe. Sometimes there's some confusion uh, by the licensees as to when they should be saying what. I'll say this is that uh, the witnesses would be required to give evidence that would be uh, evidence that uh, the licensee would like the panel to rely upon uh, in weighing whether or not there was a reasonable decision by the chief license inspector to suspend the license. Mm -hmm. So if you have any evidentiary points, Ms. Kochar, uh, that you'd like to put before the panel, uh, then you should be giving evidence on your own accord. So you would be the witness. Oh, okay. Um, 
I'm not sure I fully understand that. So I'm, I'm supposed to provide evidence on why it's my principal residence. Is that right? Well, if that's what you want the panel to consider, then now would be the time to, uh, to give that evidence as a witness. Okay. So... Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I fully understand if how this is different from opening and closing remarks. So if I repeat myself, I apologize. Um, but I, I, I believe that I've, um, I mean, to start, I reside at 802-183 Kiefer Place for majority of the year, as you can see in my calendar. Um, we only operate, um, a short term rent, we only operate Airbnb and do short term rental in the summer months um, because it's a way for us to make a little bit of extra cash. Uh, and Vancouver is a really expensive place um, to live. And I'm, I'm a new mom and I'm on maternity leave. So there's that's been really helpful um, in getting a little bit of extra money to help with the mortgage payments. Um, I can testify that I do not own any other um, uh, residences. Um, I am not that well off that I have the luxury of owning and living in multiple places. Um, we moved into 802 Kiefer, 183 Kiefer Place um, shortly after um, the pandemic. I believe it was in the summertime um, because the rental market was becoming terrible. Um, and so we decided to move into that unit. And at that time, um, my partner and I were both working from home. So we didn't know um, what to do as far as uh, how we were going to um, separate our office spaces, because both of us take a lot of meetings. Um, so our unit probably did sit empty for maybe one month not even probably um, um, the, sorry, when I say, you know, I mean, 802, 183 Kiefer Place. Um, and then uh, a cousin, my cousin, Paul, who um, is actually our property manager, um, is, he, rec he said to me, hey, um, I can, why don't you guys do short-term rental for a few months um, and see how it goes? So because we had um, at that time uh, 613 as well, where which we get very, very cheap rent, um, we decided that, okay, well, um, sure, we can try to see how it works for a few months. Um, but we, and then after that, we moved in to 802183 Keeper Place. So for a timeline, we're looking at 2020. That's when, uh, in the summer of 2020, that's when we would have moved into 802-183 Kiefer Place. Um, we li looked into subletting our unit at 613 um, Abbott Street. Um, the reason we didn't give that unit up is because m my partner's family is um, lives in Ireland um, and his sister has three kids and she also lives in Ireland. Um, so we have them come visit and stay with us for um, uh, large chunks of time, like I'm talking, um, you know, more than a few weeks at a time. And it's not, we don't feel comfortable staying in the same place. So um, it made the most sense for us to um, keep that 613 unit at that time. And then um, as we went further on, my partner uses 613 Abbott Street. It's only a one bedroom, just to clarify. He uses that um, as an office space. Um, to conduct his work, and I stay in 802-183 Kiefer Place uh, with our baby for the most part, and he also needs that space, um, not working at home with the child. Um, I'm, I know, Mr. Manji, you said you raised three kids. I'm sure um, your kids wouldn't have been running around uh, in the house while you were working. Um, it's not, doesn't make for a very good environment. So, um, I don't know if that satisfies why we have two places. Um, oh, I also forgot to mention that my partner's um, uh, um, anyway, that's not relevant. It's fine. 
Um, okay, I don't know what else I should be saying. I also um, pay my taxes um, uh, for uh, at 802-183 Kiefer. I declare that as my pr principal residence. I satisfy from a tax perspective. I can confirm that I'm an accountant. From a tax perspective, um, 802-183 Kiefer Place is considered my principal residence, especially since I only own one unit. Um, all of my MSP, my driver's license, my vehicle is registered for 183 Kiefer Place. And, you know, just to clarify, it would be really bad for my insurance if I wasn't um, actually living at that place where my car was parked most of the time because most of us are working from home. So um, that is also there. Um, I receive and I pay all my bills out of uh, 802 uh, Kiefer Place. Um, as far as I understood and I know, I satisfied the principal residence unit um, definition and the bylaw um, to the best of my knowledge. To the best of my knowledge, I satisfied uh, and I was very compliant in providing all of the documents that the city required. Um, I have uh, many tiffs with Roy, our Strata president, who I'm sure is the one that's submitting all of these complaints um, because he can't handle, or he is very anti short term rental um, because he's had a few of his own bad experiences with it. And you're, abs this, you're absolutely right. There were quite a few units in our building that were um, uh, operating short term rental uh, without being compliant, and there were. Um, causing quite a nuisance for um, other uh, residents residents in our building. And I think that's why people, it became um, this, there was this um, fight uh, became um, prevalent between pro-STR and anti-STR in our, in our building. And I'm sure um, the city receives complaints for many other uh, units in this building that, that also operate uh, short-term rental. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd also like to say, I mean, the city is determined that, you know, 802 and 3 Kiefer is now my principal residence. I just don't understand. Um, I just, I just don't understand how they could have uh, determined that that isn't, uh, and it's, it's like in order for that not to be my principal residence, I would have to be living for a large chunk of time somewhere else, and I don't see w what the city could believe that that place could be. Um, so anyway, I would like to testify and be a witness for myself that I am in fact. Um, living at 802-183 Keeper Place, and it is my principal residence. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's it for your, this is um, just, you, you do get closing comments just so that you, <laughs> you understand that you were right. So there is this point where you get to sort of introduce or do opening remarks, but, um, and you've said that you don't have any other witnesses. So I'm going to move to the panel members and uh, ask if they've got any questions for you. Councillor Zhou. Okay, so uh, Ms. Kosher, so I just have one question. I think uh, on uh, August 2nd, based on the document, it says uh, you said uh, you and your, your husband, your child live with your family in Surrey, and they do not live at this uh, AO2183 Kiefer place. Is that right? Sorry, uh, can you tell me what, where you're, what, what you're referring to? What so on um, page six or page, uh, uh, there's, I saw two places, or page 97. So it says on August, 20, uh, August 2nd, you said uh, yourself and your husband and child live with your family in Surrey, and they do not live at A02183 Kiefer, Kiefer Place. That Did is you? absolutely untrue. I don't know why. Um, that's why I asked if that conversation was recorded because, I mean, she also thinks that I have a 10-year-old child, so I don't know why she said that I lived in Surrey. That is very false. I actually told her that at the, that day, um, I was staying, at that moment, I was staying with my mom in Surrey, um, but I haven't lived in Surrey since 2015. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, thank you, Councillor Joan. Councillor Fry, questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> now, from the definition, and now I, 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 get, I appreciate you're trying to maintain that this is, in fact, your your, your principal residence unit, um, which is, seems difficult to square. We, we, we define principal residence unit as a dwelling where the individual lives, uh, makes their home, and conducts their daily affairs, which seems perhaps that this is not where you do your daily affairs. And the, the, the list of supporting evidence that has been discussed throughout this is, is really meant to bolster that. But on the sole premise that this is your, your, your principal residence where you do your daily affairs, uh, how do you explain your unlicensed long-term residential or rental accommodation um, warning letter? Yeah, so I, the reason for that is our property manager, once we told him that we were suspended from doing short-term uh, rentals, he assumed and changed it to 30-day rentals on his own accord. I don't have access to our Airbnb listing. It's managed by our Airbnb, uh, sorry, our property manager named Paul. And so he had done that. When I received that letter, I didn't even know that our list, our unit was listed for um, uh, 30 day, 30 day rental. So I, once I let him know, he removed that listing immediately. But I don't understand if it's your primary residence, how, how can he just give it away for over 30 days and where do you go? So at that time, so as you can see in our calendars, we uh, had decided that specific year just to rent out our unit for the summer months. So we decided on May 15th or early in May that hey, like, you know, the summer is coming up. It, it'd be good to make some extra cash. Why don't we try to do that short-term rental again, seeing how, you know, it was, it worked out pretty well uh, over Christmas. So um, I'm pretty sure it was May 15th that we listed our um, unit on Airbnb. And May 17th was when the complaint was received. So um, we had told our property manager that we, to list the place and see how much booking, how many bookings we get. And we had gotten bookings like pretty quickly for a lot of the summer months. And so we hadn't determined at that point what date we were going to move back into the unit. Um, but mm -hmm. I had mentioned even in my interview that we weren't going to, it wasn't going to be later than fall. So by the end of September, once the busy season is over, we were planning on moving in. So it really, can't be considered, in fairness, your your principal residence, though. I'm, I don't know why that would be, because it's only we're only renting it out for the summer months. So primarily for eight months out of the year, we're living in that unit, conducting all of our business in that unit, conducting all of our daily affairs, as per the bylaw, uh, in that unit. It's only for a few, four months out of the year. Actually, we have the numbers, only 32% of the year that... For 32% of the year, I can agree that if you were to only look at those isolated 32% of that 32% of that time, it's not my principal residence for 32% of that time. But for the remainder, 68% of the time, it is my principal residence. I do conduct all of my daily affairs in that unit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, okay, okay. Um, I mean, the, 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 this, the spirit of the bylaw is sort of outlined in, in and I and I think that it's it's pretty clear. But that's thanks for answering the questions. No problem. Okay, that's that's it for questions um, from panel members. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc, I don't have any questions. Thank you. No questions. Okay, I'm um, closing submissions. Um, I'm up. Am I up? Yes, it's closing submissions by our council. Thank you. Um, there's been some mention of the spirit of the bylaw here. I'm going to ask that. Maybe we refocus it from spirit of the bylaw to the purpose of the bylaw. Uh, this entire scheme uh, was uh, created by staff and enacted by council several years ago to address a diminishing stock of long term housing. The purpose of the principal residency requirement uh, is that it ensures that any property in the city that's being offered for short term rental accommodation is actually a residence in which people conduct their daily affairs and, and, and fall within that definition 
uh, that is established in the uh, in the bylaw. Uh, the licensee has has indicated that she's confused how um, there's no explanation by the city as to where she goes, and there would need to be large chunks of time uh, for which she need to be absent from her uh, from her her property. I think that's borne out by uh, by the uh, by the evidence. Uh, the indication, and that's not controverted at this point, is that uh, it was uh, uh, it was vacated uh, in mid-May. Uh, by the time in August uh, that the uh, premises had been um, audited and a decision was made by the chief license inspector, it was still uh, being occupied uh, not by a uh, a, a principal uh, resident. It was occupied by short-term rental accommodation. Uh, parties on on more or less a full time basis. We still don't know when the parties moved back into the uh, into the unit. Um, that wasn't provided in evidence, but there was allusion in in response to Constable Fry's question um, that it was at least uh, at the end of uh, at the end of September. So well over uh, well over a third of the year, uh, whereby the residents vacated the unit. A principal residence isn't uh, simply a place that you can move in and out of at convenience, treating it and perhaps other residences like musical chairs that you can uh, stay in uh, in order to uh, supplement your income. Uh, it is intended to be and to remain uh, a full-time uh, principal uh, residence. Uh, that's not what's been borne out uh, by the evidence. The decision of the Chief License Inspector uh, that um, that the licensee had not established to the chief license inspector's satisfaction that this was a principal residence, and the onus is on the licensee to establish that, um, uh, was a reasonable uh, decision. Uh, that information was available uh, to the chief license inspector, um, and when that information was available, it still wasn't being occupied by the chief or by the, uh, by the principal residence. Uh, so I'd ask uh, that the panel defer to the chief license inspector's decision, uphold the uh, the suspension of the 2022 license. Thank you, Thank you Mr. LeBlanc. Um, Ms. Kodar, it's, um, it's now your turn to do your closing comments. We, you are on mute. We can't hear you. Sorry, uh, apologies. Um, as for all the evidence that's been submitted, and as it's been mentioned earlier, I only operate short-term rental for a small portion of the year, and for the remaining of the time, I reside at 802-183 Kiefer Place. Uh, in the 12-month period of the initial audit, my unit was rented for 35% of the time. In the second audit for the 12, month, 12 months, my unit was rented only for 32% of the year. I feel that the city has made many speculations and assumptions to conclude that 802-183 Kiefer Place is not my principal residence, such as not stocking my fridge and not having personal belongings in my unit during the compliance in inspection. I was advised by our property manager that we should remove all items in the fridge as it's not sanitary and guess one empty fridge due to COVID fears. He also advised that we not keep any of our personal clothes and valuables there for two reasons. One, he will not be liable if they get stolen. And two, there's not enough closet space left for our guests if we leave our stuff in there. In my lifetime, I have stayed at many Airbnbs and not at one place have I seen the host's clothes left in the closet. If that is the expectation of the city for them to believe that it's my principal residence, quite frankly, I think it's absurd. I find I'd like for the panel to consider whether they would feel safe and comfortable leaving their clothes and toothbrushes and extra pairs of glasses, jewelry, or accessories at your place if you had random strangers that you would never you've never met before staying there would you leave photo albums full of your family photos your baby's first photo shoot your memories all there for strangers to look at take photos out and potentially post on social media my son took his first steps said his first words and had many sleepless nights in 80213 keeper place we look forward to celebrating the holidays there having our friends over and continue to make memories in our home, 802-183 Kiefer Place. It is in fact my principal residence by every means. If we're worried about the housing crisis, I think we should also have more faith in the empty homes tax and vacancy taxes, which I can assure you I cannot afford to pay. 
I don't know what my future plans are with in with regards to short term rental. I don't even know if I want to continue as seeing it's it's been such a headache in the past few years, and I'm tired of having this vendetta with my neighbors. As I stated in our interview, our plan was only to operate short term rental for the busy summer months so that we can make a little bit of extra cash. Forgive me for doing so. I didn't know that wasn't allowed. I'm here today to get justice, and I'm here because the city wrongfully suspended my license. And I want the city to be held accountable for this decision. You, that, that's all. Thanks, Ms. Kochar. Um, panel members, it's now um, up to you uh, if you want further discussion um, or move to a, dis a decision with uh, comments to that. Um, I'll look to see if any of you put yourself on the list for discussion. Um, just one second. Councillor Fry, go ahead. Councillor Fry, I think you're on mute. Apologies. Uh, I, I did uh, submit a recommend uh, a motion to uphold the license inspector's recommendation to suspend the business license. I'm just going to make um, sure, just before you continue, let's just make sure that that is projected onto the, the screen so that it's available for Ms. Kocher. Yep, it's up on the screen now. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Fry. Yeah, um, you know, I, I just want to re reflect that uh, I, I, I do uh, sympathize with uh, um, Puni Kocher on on uh, how this would feel, um, you know, personally upsetting. But it, it is this is the, the the bylaw as we've written it, and it really does require this sort of principal residence component, and and I. I do feel satisfied that the, the evidence suggests this is not actually a principle of residence in the spirit of which it's been written. And I also do want to just, you know, reflect and it's not necessarily germane to the specific case, but we get a lot of complaints from that particular part of town, um, Forenza, Paris Place, all in and around Kiefer and Abbott there, uh, and really horrendous complaints. So um, for the folks who really are, uh, principal re residents of those buildings, we hear from them and we hear how disruptive uh, the constant stream of Airbnbs can be people who are just visiting there and don't have that sort of investment into living in the units. And that's not a reflection on the, on the owner in this case, but it's, it's a reflection on the guest, And, and that can be super frustrating. So I really do appreciate that folks uh, are frustrated by um Scenarios where where the, the 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 spirit of the the bylaw here is not being upheld, and in fact, the actual specifics of the bylaw are not being upheld. And I think, uh, you know, it, it the argument sort of falls apart when we start looking at the shifting to long term re rental, um, and and really the some the, the photos that we see, and I certainly recognize that, you know, obviously you wouldn't want to keep your really personal stuff in 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 plain view for guests um but but our, our 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 staff and our investigators are pretty pretty adept at kind of identifying how people who actually live in their primary residence kind of can keep things sequestered in, in an appropriate way uh, to keep them private but uh you can still tell and i've seen enough of these evidence packages to sort of see the difference as well um so i'm i'm sorry to the applicant that you uh are going to lose this um this revenue generator but at the same time you still have a fantastic home in downtown vancouver and a great place to raise your your kid and um i hope it um continues to be your home and your primary residence and who knows maybe you can reapply for a short-term license in, in the future and, and uh with it as your principal residence when you're off on vacation or something to that effect Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Fry. We're going to need a seconder um, for that motion. Councillor Joe, thank you. Um, and Councillor Joe, you are next um, on the speaker's list. Okay, so very quick. I think uh, I'd like to uh, echo what uh, Councillor Fry has just said. Uh, I do empathy for the, uh, the situation for the applic applicant, but uh, all the evidence uh, is pretty evident. And uh, uh, I think the law is the law. The policy is policy. We have to follow whatever we have in the bylaw. And uh, a, the, the, the comments from the applicant uh, 
didn't give me enough con didn't convince me enough to uh, overturn my decision based on all the evidence from the inspector. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Zhou. Um, I will just add my comments at, at the end. And I, um, I certainly understand the, the frustration felt um, um, by, um, by our um, Ms. Koshar. Uh, and uh, it's I, and I do understand from the point of view of having, as, sh as you've said, um, stayed in many different B and Bs around the world. I too, I too have stayed in in many, um, but other places have different laws or rules or policies around it. And the reason why Vancouver is different, and we are um, one of those unique jurisdictions, is because we have such an incredible housing crisis in this city. And it was recognized by surveys um, just how many, um, especially in the downtown part of Vancouver, how many um, homes, especially condos, um, were primarily left empty um, or used for um, as Airbnbs, but um, um, much of the year left empty uh, at a time when um, people could not find places to live at all. Um, so we did bring in the bylaw to enable us to, um, to only uh, license places that are primary residences um, and thus um, uh, only vacated um, on a very short-term basis for a weekend or a night or but not for months at a time and um, and the consequence of our bylaw has been a return to the rental market of a phenomenal number of places that formerly had just been sitting empty for much of the year um, which is the intent of the bylaw so I understand your frustration but just wanted to let you know why um, we are a different city in that regard and um, and the compelling reasons um, which which may be frustrating for you but um, in the bigger picture have have uh, really supplied more housing into into a much needed market. Um, so um, we are. I'm not seeing any other comments. Uh, well, we've all commented. So I think we can move to a vote on this um, matter. Thank you, Clerk. Oh, sorry. Just one second. I don't see you on the list, Councillor. No, no. Have you? It's on. It's here. The motion. Oops. It's gone. Um, the motion should be on the front screen again if you don't. It, it, it was emailed and it's... Okay, I'm going to read that so that it's clear that the business license hearing panel suspend the 2022 business license issued at Tupini Kuchar, the licensee for a short-term rental accommodation at 802-183 Kiefer Place, the premises, on the basis that the unit is not the primary residence of the owner, as evidenced by the investigation of premises and the listings, and additionally, the owner's advertisement uh, um, an unlisted unlicensed long-term rental accommodation in response to their short-term license suspension. <clears throat> so, are we clear on what we're voting on? Great. Okay. Um, now, Clerk, if you could move us to a vote. Great. Um, that vote passes unanimously. Um, so at this point, we are concluding. We've concluded um, the uh, the this hearing, and um, I would ask for an adjourn, a motion to adjourn, please. Thank you, Joe. Um, and a seconder, Councillor Fry. Um, you may be on mute. Hi. Uh, second. Thank you very much. Um, all those in favor. Great. Any opposed? This hearing is adjourned.